Alrighty, we are here with Peter Rojas, one of the the true innovators and uh, spearheads in the world of tech and gadgets. And I'll just call you Inspector Gadget. Peter, really, really <laughs> excited to talk to you today about Engadget, Gizmodo, uh, some of the other really, really cool things throughout your career. Thank you so much for joining. How are you doing today? Hey, good. Thanks for having me on. Of course, of course. And uh, we're, we're going to get to those things I alluded to. But first, I want to detail the entire plot of the uh, sequel to Inspector Gadget. So I think you, I, I sent you to come prepared with that in advance. Sorry, that was, that was like the corny. My, my, my six-year-old is obsessed with Inspector Gadget. So it's uh, coming back, huh? It's coming back. Yeah. <laughs> no, but uh, before we get to Inspector in Gadget and Inspector Gizmodo, <laughs> you really started to, I guess, make a name for yourself in that space in the very early days of blogging, meaning like, you know, not too many years before that blogs were even invented, RSS feeds were even a thing. Yeah. When was the first time that you heard about a blog yourself and it piqued your interest? Um, that's a good question, because I think that there were there were certainly things that seemed like blogs right at the time um, and that you might have been reading and not realizing <clears throat> where a blog, I'm, um, you know, is slashed out of blog, right? Um, you know, maybe not. I mean, they might not have thought of themselves as a blog at the time, but like certainly when it came to, um, you know, being uh, the sort of like the, the big important news tech news site, like that was, it was slashed out, right? Like that's where, um, you know, we were reading and, and um, you know, as a, I was a technology journalist at the time, it was about 25 years ago. And so I was reading slashed out like every day, looking for ideas for stories and things like that. And so um, I think I remember, you know, the, blogging really becoming like something that people were talking about was um, the New Yorker did a story about um, it was uh, about Evan Williams and Jason Kotke and um, the sort of like the blogger kind of that early blogger world, like the blogger, like the company. Um, and I remember reading that and, and um, being sort of fascinated because, you know, I was a professional journalist. And so the idea that you would, um, you know, give your writing away was, you know, like kind of weird, but on the same hand, on the same token, like I had been in the punk scene and had done like a zine self-published, like, you know, you zero, go and Xerox it after hours, you know, your friend who works there hooks you up with free, you know, photocopies and stuff like that. Um, and then I'd actually done, and this has kind of been lost to history, but I did a music site called continuous sound in like 98. And, um, this was pre like blogging software. <clears throat> and, and I think one of the things we forget is that it was actually really, really difficult to self publish on the web at the time. Um, first of all, there like when I worked at Red, I worked at Red Herring magazine. It was a big business of technology magazine in the late nineties, early two thousands. And I remember when we wanted a content management system so we could publish to the, on the website that cost a million bucks, like a professional software, you know, like we, we paid a million dollars for that. Um, it has less functionality um, than WordPress, which is free today, right? You can download for free. Um, and so when I was doing continuous sound, I had a friend who like was better at HTML than me. And so whenever I, I wrote a new, it was mainly like music reviews, like record reviews, because I was trying to, I wanted to get like free CDs and records <laughs> um, sent to me. Uh, and so, uh, which worked. Uh, and when I had like a, a new review to post up, he would, um, I would send him the, like email him the text and then he would copy it and then like manually edit the HTML of the page so that it was like the top of the page, right? There wasn't, I, I couldn't just go and do it myself. <clears throat> and so, you know, when, um, you know, the early first early, um, uh, you know, blog CMS has started to become available. And I, did, I started my first blog in, after I got laid off from Red Herring in May of 2001, I think I started the blog um, maybe a couple months later and I did it on Dave Weiner's software, um, called web logger and, um, very rudimentary. You had to like, you know, it didn't just autom automatically update. You had to do all this stuff to like, get like up, like, man like get the whole, like, you know, installation to refresh. Um, there are no comments. Like there was, it was, you know, I don't, I don't even sure I could upload photos to it. I, I don't remember at the time. Oh man. Um, so time for bleak. Yeah, it's very rudimentary, but it was kind of amazing. That's like, oh, like I could just publish and kind of figure out like what I, you know, if I have something to say, I can just like put it out there. And um, when uh, I, I started doing, 
you know, after I got laid off from, from Red Herring in 2001 and wasn't sure what I was going to do, I couldn't find a job. I was like doing this thing where I was you know, applying for jobs. And then I'd come, I go to like check if, you know, I'd like, you know, check in with the person and be like, Hey, like what's going on. And I get a bounce back because the company had gone out of business. Like that's like, we hear about stuff going out of business now, but like things would be like going, going, going. And then just like disappear. Oh, like, man. you know what I mean? Like just gone. And, um, it, it was, it was just absolutely, uh, a, a really difficult time. And as early as it felt as early as we may look back and see, um, at the time people thought like, well, the web, we've been doing this for about, you know, eight or nine years. It had a good run, but like, it's not really working out. And, you know, that's that, right? Like, I remember when I uh, um, uh, decided to do Gizmodo, I had people tell me like, you're committing career suicide. Um, you know, like, you're not going to be respected. Re if you want a real journalism job, doing blogging is just going to devalue you. People are not going to respect you. People are going to think that, you know, you're not serious, et cetera, et cetera. And I just fell in love with the, like the prospect of democratization of this stuff. Again, having been a punk kid in the nineties, the idea that like, you know, it's all about DIY, do it yourself. You want to put you want to be in a band and put on a record. Don't wait to get signed to a label, just go. And you can just put out a record yourself. You want to set up a show, go, don't ask for permission. Just go and like, you know, go find a play, go, go do it. And so I was setting up shows on my own. I was playing in bands, putting out records like doing all that stuff and you weren't waiting for permission. You would just do things. And so I saw blogging as like an extension of that. So before we get to Gizmodo, which I'm a huge sucker for alliteration. So that sentence just made me very happy. So thank you for that. But it, you mentioned with your, when you were in the music business, quote unquote, what was this, your favorite CD of all time that you got uh, for free? Oh, I don't, you know, I don't remember now. Um, it's, uh, I'm not sure I, I, I'm not sure how much stuff I even, I mean, I got, I definitely got sent stuff. I'm not sure I got stuff that sent anything that great. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I also had been the music director of my college radio station. And so we got sent tons and tons of stuff to review all the time. And that was my, my job was to deal with the labels and, um, report, you know, back what we were playing and all that stuff. Um, so that's a good question. I, I we got sent so much like great stuff. But oftentimes, like the best music, honestly, was stuff that we would go out and find ourselves. And, and you know, the label couldn't even afford to send out, you know, d like promotional copies or anything like that. So let's get to Gizmodo, shout out alliteration, and Engadget. How did you decide to start these in the first place? You know, it, it's, it's funny because, um, you know, at the time, I was just a broke writer living in New York, right? Like, Barely, you know, I, uh, I had, I had made, I, I had saved up enough from doing red herring that, um, I was getting by, I was picking up some freelance gigs here and there. Um, but you know, it was something where, um, it, it seemed like I couldn't find a job. I, I, I do have this passion around this and, um, I was friends with Nick Denton. Uh, and so, you know, people might not know, but Gizmodo was the first predated Gawker media itself. It sort of it became after we started Gawker six months later, then it was like, Nick's like, Oh, there's a company here. Um, and, uh, we saw it as more of an experiment. Nick and I were both really passionate about blogging. He also, uh, was a, a blogger as well, his own personal site. And, um, we started this one, this, there was a site called Wi-Fi networking news, which was a big inspiration for us. And, um, it was this guy, Glenn Fleischman who still writes, uh, and is, uh, I've, you know, in touch with him. I think we just chatted a few months ago, actually. Um, he did this site uh, uh, that he started, which was just about Wi-Fi, which again, Wi-Fi in the year 2000, 2001 was still very new. And uh, I remember, I think I got my first Wi-Fi adapter, like PCMCIA card for my laptop in like December of 2001, right? Uh, and the idea that like you could, rather than having Wi-Fi be like, in the old, in the previous days, like the publishing model, right? You had to have Wi-Fi would have been like one small section of like a bigger publication, right? Because you couldn't have the economics of having a publication just focus on Wi-Fi. It maybe didn't make sense, but because of blogging, where you could have one person and you didn't have all this technology, you didn't have all the costs of of you know publishing and and building the site and all that stuff. Stuff that even in the early web days still you know had cost a decent amount of money. Um, suddenly, like one person who was passionate about something could go very deep into that topic and build an audience. 
And um, I mean, I love that website and I, I still really, I'm, I'm still kind of a Wi-Fi nerd. Like it's, it's one of my passions is actually like just Wi-Fi gear. And like, um, I almost like wish that I had more I could do with my network at home. I mean, I have like four hotspots and like, you know, like enterprise grade gear. Yeah. But I'm just like, I'm always like, should I be upgrading? Should I be laying cat nine? You know, like all this stuff. Right. Um, and so I just like, I, I was really inspired by that. And so we thought like, well, what's another like niche topic that like I'm interested in that we think no one's doing anything with that maybe could be business. Right. And we're like, we had a couple ideas, but like, you know, the thing that like we settled on was gadgets because like, I really love gadgets. I know it sounds wild, but it seemed like a real niche topic at the at the time. It was like super niche. Um, there weren't really any publications just focused on gadgets. And, and again, there were some enthusiast kind of community bulletin board type of sites. And, and there were some trade publications and things like that, but there wasn't anything like Gizmodo at the time. And so, um, so we started it and, uh, I think we started, I think we started working on it in July or we started working on it in February of that year of 2002, um, soft launched in July and then like kind of formally launched it in like August of 2002. And within a few weeks, we were getting like 50,000 readers a day. And, you know, again, coming from the magazine world, um, where I think Red Herring had had a hundred thousand, you know, subscribers or something that I was like, well, this is enormous, like, like 50,000 readers, right? Um, now it's nothing, right? And, uh, uh, you know, compared for, for a, a, a big tech publication, right? Uh, and so, but it started to grow. And it was just me. I was the only person who wrote for it. And my goal was to write, you know, like four to six things per day. Uh, and then I just found that, like, as I spent more time on it, the audience was growing. I started to kind of figure out things that... Um, like I had to make everything up as I went along, right? Like I didn't know what were the rules of the of the game, so to speak. It was I wasn't trying to write the stuff I had written as a journalist before, because those were, you know, longer pieces that I would take sometimes like weeks working on and reporting and editing. It was more lightweight, it was more fun, but I wasn't sure how playful I can be, how casual I could be, what is the tone. And so really those first six months was just me trying to figure out what's the voice of this of Gizmodo and like what are people interested in? What am I interested in? How do those intersect? And you know, once I started to find my rhythm, I got really, really into it. And I realized what I had thought of as being like a bridge to finding another job down the line. Like, oh, I'll do Gizmodo and like, you know, maybe I'll get another, I'll get a real job. And in fact, um, it, you know, it ended up being something where I just loved doing it and wanted to do it full time and have that be my only thing. And so there were kind of two events that kind of catalyzed me leaving Gizmodo to do. Um, you know, Weblogs Inc. with Jason Calcanis, where I ended up starting in Gadget. One was, um, uh, you know, I, I got an offer to be the technology editor for Money Magazine. And they said, you know, you know, it was like, for me, it was like an astronomical amount of money, you know, they were going to pay me. In retrospect, it was like nothing, right? Um, but it was like a real job, I have health insurance, I'll work at Time Inc., which is like one of the biggest, you know, most prestigious publishers in the world, et cetera, et cetera. But they said, but you can't do Gizmodo anymore. And I thought, well, I don't want to give this up. Like, I like this more. And I think this has more potential. And um, and then, you know, I, I, I had this sort of difference of opinion with Nick, where Nick thought that the model for Gawker Media was going to be a network of blogs, each with one editor working part time, doing four to six posts a day. Uh, and that was it. And I thought, you know, I want to go and do this full time. I want to go and work on this 24 seven. I want to go and build a team. I want to go and build this into like a gigantic, like, you know, brand that is like the best in the world. And so that's why I left. How did you, how did you find a way in those early days to get that many readers and like a loyal audience that quickly? Like, wait, what can you point it to? So, um, you know, and I'll say like, it's a very, it was a different era than today. Right. Um, and so you couldn't grow an audience in a lot of the usual ways that you can grow it today. There's no, there's no Twitter, there's no Facebook, you know, no TikTok. Um, you know, there weren't even like, you know, it was hard to build a newsletter following, like, you know, it's a lot of those things that, um, uh, a lot of the, the things that we don't, you know, tools we have today, we don't have. 
I know it sounds funny, but like I really focused on two things in terms of the strategy. One was, uh, and maybe three things. One was um, uh, creating um, content every day, lots of it that people wanted to read. So just uh, my goal was every time you came to the site to engage it really Gizmodo was a little different because it was um, the, the pacing was not as uh, intense. But my goal with Engadget was every time you, you come to the, the page, there's something new for you to read. Um, and so, you know, we started posting. And again, at the beginning, it was just me. And I think I had days, I wrote 5,000 posts for Engadget in the first 15 months. And uh, I'd have days That's where it. I'd write like 25, do, 30. Do you still updates. have fingers? <laughs> yeah, no, I was exhausted. Um, it wasn't very healthy, uh, to be honest. But, um, you know, the, uh, so I really focused on like, you know, having stuff and the threshold was, is, do I find it interesting? I, 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 I and fortunately, like my interests were very broad. Like I wanted to know about all the new phones, all the new laptops, like, you know, I, I, and I, and I was very like, again, as a record former, like as a record collector, I had a very completist attitude. I was like, I'll, uh, you know, I want to, I want to be comprehensive and write about everything interesting every single day. Uh, and, um, and so, you know, that, that was part of it. Um, and then the other part was, um, it was a bit of like a barbell approach, like lots of like brief updates all day, and then have kind of signature bigger anchor things that draw people in, draw like new audiences. Um, so it'd be like, you know, exclusive interviews, with Bill Gates. Um, I was the first person to ever actually interview on a podcast, for example, um, back in the day, uh, you know, so we, or, or like, a, you know, exclusive news that we, you know, that we were able to get or, you know, first review of something or, you know, like, or we'd live blog an event or something like that. So we'd have these sort of like tentpole pieces of content that would draw in new people that people would share and people would, you know, um, uh, you know, and again, sharing was happening like person to person and like aim, like instant messaging, you know, email, like, you know, on their own blogs, things like that. Um, and then have, and so the goal was you might hear about us because of like the Bill Gates interview, but then when you discover your site, you're like, wow, I can come here every day, every hour, every 15 minutes and have something new to read that I'm excited about, I'm interested in. And so it was really a strategy of, um, you know, of embracing the intelligence of the audience and sort of saying, you know what, like, rather than sort of assuming that people are only casually interested in technology, which is like a lot of publications took, ours was you're passionate, you're a nerd, you want the inside baseball, you want the like rumors, you want the speculation, you want like, you just want it all. Um, and we're going to give it to you. And we're just as passionate. We're like in the trenches with you. We're not, you know, we're, we're going to be honest with things when we're, when we don't know something, we're going to be honest when we get something wrong. Um, you know, but it's a bit like more of a, uh, we're, we're all like hanging out and talking about this stuff together. Um, so that was, that was part of it. Then I think the other thing that we were a beneficiary of was, um, and this was actually not as intentional as, as you might think, but, um, you know, we were a beneficiary of like just er early, like white hat SEO stuff where because of the way we structured the site, it was very clean. It was easy to index. We had RSS feeds. Um, you know, we had lots of links we were high quality. We didn't let spam, you know, we weren't spamming. We weren't doing, you know, anything weird. Google really loved us. And so we had a high page rank. Um, and at the same time, the companies we were covering often like didn't know what they were doing. Maybe they might not even have had a, a good website, you know, like, it's amazing to think, but like there were companies that would launch a new product and it wouldn't be on their website or they launch it and they'd have like no photos of it, no information about it. And so when, you know, there was a time where if you Googled Apple iPod, we came up above Apple. That's amazing. That, that could be like your, uh, your LinkedIn bio, by the way, it's like, yeah, <laughs> better yeah. SEO than not, Apple. <laughs> not, not easily repeatable these days, but, uh, but there was a window there where, where we were, do, we were doing pretty well. But, but yeah, I mean, I think that was really smart of you in those early days to like lean in so hard, which sounds wrong, lean in so hard to, um, SEO and like you were, you know, early days of blogging, early days of SEO, I'm sure early days of white hat SEO. Um, what sounds like a sequel to Inspector Gadget too, but, yeah. um, what, uh, you, you mentioned that, like, you always want to write about interesting things and yeah. I, like many of us in the podcasting or content creation space, I think many of us are naturally curious, but it's one thing to like, be curious. It's another thing to be like, all right, we need to find, you know, at the start four to six 
blogs a day, like things to write every single day. And then even more of that going forward, how do you latch? Like, what, what is it that would stick out to you of like, all right, this actually deserves a post versus eh, not worth it. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, the, 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 the lens that we took it through was we, we really try to stick to hardware. Um, so we didn't really write that much about software. Um, and, and one reason we ended up doing joystick is their joystick start off as the gaming section of Engadget. Um, and we realized like there's so much volume in gaming news that like, you know, if we didn't spin this out, it would be mainly gaming related stuff. Um, and so, uh, um, so, you know, it was, it was like the threshold was, is it hardware and is there something, is it, you know, is it a new announcement? Is there something, you know, um, that we think is, is, does it come from a company that we think is worth covering? You know, I think where things, you know, are tricky now is that there are so many random, no brand uh, companies, you know, doing stuff. I think there's also, I think with a lot of the crowdfunding, you know, stuff, it's like, you know, how much is this worth covering? Because you don't even know if like they'll ever ship the, pro ever ship the product. And um, so, you know, part of it was just about like um, an editorial judgment, but I, also there seemed to be, there weren't really like a lot of downsides for um, like, if you, there, there weren't a lot, there was not, not a downside to writing about too many things for the most part. Um, you know, it's like no reader was like, oh, I wish you hadn't covered that like fourth laptop announcement yesterday or something like that. People yeah. were like, no, okay. Like, like they just, you just scroll past, you know, if you're not interested. Like how dare you provide insight and entertainment on yet another breaking new thing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, um, and so, and I think that like, it's also, you know, again, about like understanding that the flow of content, you know, would vary every day. It's not like every post was. Um, in fact, one of the rules that we had for the, uh, I wrote the first, when Engadget started, when I started to bring in other people to write for Engadget, I had to write a style guide, um, to kind of explain like what my voice was. And I realized like, okay, one thing is don't try to force the humor. Um, you know, I thought I wanted us to be, you know, clever and witty and insightful and a little bit, um, irreverent, but I never wanted us to force the humor, um, because I, that was one of the things that like, there were some other, you know, technology sites and I felt like they were always like jokey and, you know, like it, it, sometimes it works, but sometimes it felt like, oh, like it's like they got to make a joke every single post, you know? Um, and you're just like, oh, it's just like, it's not working. And so that was a rule. It's like, no, um, no, don't force a joke. If there's no joke, don't make a joke, right? It's not a big deal, <laughs> you know, get it done. And then I think the other was you can't make, if you're going to make a star Wars or a star Trek reference, you better be worth it. You know what I mean? Like right. you better, like you better be able to like, like you can't like do it cause you're lazy, you know? Cause otherwise right. it's like, everything's like, here's a new phone. That's like a star Trek communicator, you know, or that kind of stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. And after a while you're like, come on, that's it's, it's lazy like as a, as a journalist. And so it, yeah, it was, it's a trap. I think I, yeah, Literally, I think you'd have trap. to go back. I think in those first couple of years of Engadget, I think you'd be hard pressed to find more than like a couple references, you know, only when like, I mean, I remember like if there was something that was literally like, Hey, we took a Star Trek communicator and turned it into like a Bluetooth speaker, you know, like fine, like you can't avoid that. But otherwise it was, you, you better be, uh, you better be able to back this up. <laughs> when you look back now at those Gizmodo and Engadget journeys, uh, what's your favorite Star Trek? Rep no, I'm just kidding. What, what, what's yeah. the favorite? What is the, you think the single biggest business lesson that has helped you, in, you know, in, in, in the next parts of your career when you got into investing and working with other companies? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, I, I think there's a couple of things. I think as a founder, um, work on things that you are, have some connection to or some passion for because that is what pulls you through like the, the really low moments, the really low um, points that you'll hit. And, and I will tell you with everything I've started, I've always had this moment within six months of starting where I've thought, why did I do this? <laughs> like if I could just get on a plane and like flee the country and, you know, and never have to like show my face again, <laughs> um, <laughs> I would do that. Uh, if like I could afford airfare or whatever. Um, and, uh, um, and, and I think that like what pulls you through is like, no, like I, this is something that I feel really lucky to work on that I'm really excited about that, um, you know, at the end of the day, that this is something that that matters to me. And so that's my advice for people is, is never start anything cynically. 
you know, as a, when I was a VC, one of the things I always looked out for were, were people that um, I was kind of jokingly called them professional founders. Um, they just wanted to be a startup founder. Like, and I think I hate to say it, but like startup founder is, is not really a, 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 a vocation in a way, right? Like you start, a, you start the company that you start, you're the, you're the founder of a company that you start because, you know, ideally because there's some problem that you care about or some audience or some, you know, like customer problem or some technology that you're really passionate about. Um, but starting, uh, you know, so, so I, I always was on the lookout for like people that like, you know, their dream was just to be a founder. Like somebody was like, Oh, I just like always wanted to be a founder. I'm like, no man, like I didn't want to be a founder. I only started the things I started because like literally no one would hire me and I want, and I, no one else was going to start these things. Like I wanted Gizmodo to exist. I wanted Engadget to exist. And like, they weren't going to exist without me. Um, and if somebody else had done it, I would have been like, cool, like you go and do it. Like, I didn't want to be a founder because it's hard, right? And it's, it's, you know, you're anxious and stressed all the time. You have to work constantly. And, you know, most of the time it doesn't work out. And, and, and so, um, you know, I want people like as a, as a VC, like I always wanted people that were like, you know, like I just, I care so much about this that even if it fails, I'm going to be okay because I got to work on something that I cared about a lot. It is remarkable how many guests on this show who are you know entrepreneurs that have started really really cool companies that have that same sort of sentiment where like they didn't even set out to be a, a startup founder they didn't set out to be an entrepreneur they just they ran into some pain point or issue and realized that oh my god there's nothing out there doing this like after and then after a while it's like hit him in the face like duh i i should do this i could create this and so it's really cool you started that way as well uh yeah. real quick let's wrap up with some uh okay. you know in in the name of forced humor let's wrap up with some okay. rapid fire q a you ready okay. for it yeah all right what is to this day could be from any era a gadget that when you first got your hands on it you were like this is life-changing oh trio 600 um it was the first sorry, truly so, sorry great. again the trio right, palm right, trio right. 600 um it was the first like really great smartphone i think um i mean people have different opinions but um you know it, it was you know i could do email on it i could you know surf the web i could run some games it was it's just like 2003 it came out um and i i just remember um it could play videos you know music uh, and it was all clunky, right? You had to sync it with a desktop and, you know, all this stuff. Um, but you could see the vision of where things were going to go with that. And I just remember it being really life-changing for me when, again, as somebody who worked all the time, if I could check my email in bed, like just get up and just, you know, do that. Um, I was like, oh, like now I can sort of keep, I can like leave my desk because I can be out. And like, if something happens, if like there's some crazy breaking news story, like I can deal with it and get home. I couldn't post to Gizmodo from the phone. That was a little bit too beyond the capabilities of the device, but I can kind of stay on top of things. And, um, and so I, 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 I really loved it. And, and, uh, you know, it was a, it was a, uh, I don't know. I just like, I loved that phone. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like you, you kind of like it. No. <laughs> yeah. no, no, that's really cool. What is the number one thing to do in Peru? Not name Machu Picchu. Oh, you got to go to Arequipa, uh, which is where my father's from. Uh, and, um, oh. it's just beautiful, all colonial city, a lot of, um, uh, uh, to call La, La Silla Blanca. It's like a lot of, um, white volcanic stone made from, uh, and, uh, just absolutely beautiful and sort of like a hidden, not really hidden, but like definitely like the kind of the cultural capital of Peru. And, and, um, I, I think, I don't know anybody who's been there who hasn't been like, Oh my God, this is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. <laughs> well, your pronunciation is much better than mine. So I'm not going to try to pronounce it. However, I will Google that and put it in the show notes and, uh, and hopefully go there one day and say, Oh, this is the best place I've ever been. Yeah, and then right. last one, okay. if you could, if you could star in a video game, what character would you be? Oh, wow. That's a, that's a tough one. I feel like um, most video games, you end up uh, getting killed a lot, a lot, but, um, <laughs> it, it, it's a risk you had to be virtually one to take. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm still trying to finish uh, red dead redemption two. Um, you know, like five and a half years later. Um, but, uh, there's something about like that, that world. I'm not, I'm not like a big, like cowboy guy, you know, or Western guy, but, um, 
I think there's something about like the richness of that world where I just, I just love, you know, when, like when I've had opportunities to like really immerse myself in that game, there's something like really great about like kind of living in that. You kind of feel some of the slower pace of that world, I guess. Yeah. It's it the creativity and the beauty in that seems off the charts. Uh, Peter, thank you so much. Just thank you for all you've done and, and making time today and uh, your endless curiosity in the gadget world and beyond. Uh, wait, where's your number one go-to place for people to contact you or get, get in touch with you if they want to connect online? Yeah, um, just roj.as. That's my personal website and uh, it's pretty easy to reach me there. Perfect. Ro.has. No, that doesn't work out that way. But <laughs> roj.as. Yeah, it's ro. Yeah. ro yeah. You, don't want to, you don't want to say it. You just want to spell it. <laughs> And then final thoughts, one line of parting advice for uh, other aspiring entrepreneurs out there. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, I, I, I think be realistic about like what it is you really want and what you're willing to put up with. Um, and um, and also, I think the thing I always tell people is, um, you know, don't BS yourself about when things are working, when they're not, uh, because, you know, this is a sort of and I've fallen for myself where you like you can't let go of something that's not working and you spend too much time on it. And, you know, sometimes you have to like cut your losses and move on and it's difficult. But, you know, I think one of the things about being an uh, entrepreneur is that, you know, ideally you get multiple times to <laughs> try things. And, and everybody I know has, has, um, you know, every, every successful entrepreneur I know has had, you know, multiple failures along the way. Bring on the bongos.